I have heard of uh, claims that people are moving their money over to the large financial banks um, it, it, under the uh, thinking that somehow they're safer, um, that they're too big to fail, and so the government's going to come to the rescue and prevent those banks from failing. But actually, in reality, if anything, the opposite is the case. That Do Title II of Dodd-Frank effectively put an end to the whole concept of too big to fail. Instead, Dodd-Frank made so that there, there, there would be a route to allowing the big banks to fail without them negatively or too drastically impacting the whole financial system. Um, yeah, let me read this from the this is from the Cornell Law School uh, of their commentary on Title II of Dodd-Frank. It says here, Title II, the order, orderly liquidation provision of the Dodd-Frank Act provides a process to quickly and efficiently liquidate a large, complex financial company that is close to failing. So it's going to liquidate it. That means it's going to come, It's it, the, the government's not going to save it. Um, and it goes on to say, Title II provides an alternative to bankruptcy in which the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, FDIC, is appointed as a receiver to carry out the liquidation and wind up of the company. The FDIC is given certain powers as a receiver and a three to five year time frame in which to finish the, the liquidation process. Title, Title II is aimed at protecting the financial stability of the American economy, forcing shareholders and creditors to bear the loss of the failed financial company, removing management that was responsible, responsible for the financial condition of the company and ensuring that payout to claimants is at least as much as the claimants would have received under bankruptcy li liquidation purpose. In 2008, large financial institu institutions that had always been considered too big to fail were in dire, were in dire financial straits. The government attempted to pres preserve some of these institutions with over $1.7 trillion in bailouts to companies. Despite the bailouts, over 250 banks failed in the period from 2008 to 2010. And Lehman Brothers, the fourth largest investment bank in the United States, filed for bankruptcy, the largest Chapter 11 bankruptcy in U.S. history. In light of these too big to fail institutions, Congress saw the need for government authority to provide for efficient liquidation of large, complex financial institutions and to, to eliminate the potential of future government bailouts. So let's see, it's going to be... So, yeah, Dodd-Frank is there not to, not to save these so-called too-big-to-fail banks, but to provide a route for them to liquidate. Let's go to back to this entry here from Cornell uh, Law School regarding Title II of the Dodd-Frank Act. It says here, the FDIC is, is given certain pro powers as a receiver and three to five year time frame, blah, blah, blah. Okay, yeah, this is what I want. Title II is aimed at protecting the financial stability of the American economy, forcing shareholders and creditors to bear the loss of the failed financial company. Okay, that's the main point there I wanted to emphasize is that they're gonna force um, shareholders, or it says, forcing shareholders and creditors to bear the loss of the failed financial company. Now, th th that, that may not seem like such a big deal if you have a, an account as a depositor at one of those large financial institutions, but they, the problem there is that creditors are considered um, or depositors are considered to be depre uh, creditors. So, according in the eyes of the law, uh, when you're depositing bank into your savings or checking an account or in a CD, in the eyes of the law, you're not 
putting your money there to be safeguarded by the bank. You are loaning your money to the bank. So you're being a creditor to the bank that you're depositing your money into with, with the promise of the bank paying back on demand. But but you're, you're being like an unsecured creditor too to make matters worth, worse. Uh, so there's, there's no like collateral in exchange for you depositing their money. They're just promising, the bank is promising it to pay you back your money with, with a certain degree of interest if it's interest bearing account. But so that's a, that's a, like a debt on their books of the bank. So then, according to the, therefore, according to this title, Title II, when a bank is one of these large, systemically important finance institu institutions, SIFIs or SIFIs, um, if there's failing, then it's the brunt is of that failure is going to happen on the backs of not only shareholders but also depositors because the depositors are considered creditors and that's the creditors are ones that are supposed to bear the brunt of a uh, of the bank failing and when the depositors bear that brunt then that's known as a bail-in where the depositor funds are used to is it as part of the liquidation process in informing I'm trying to trying to study up on the it's it's kind of confusing. Um, I think that they, what they do is they form a new bank. The FDIC does. The FDIC takes over. For, it takes a receivership of the failing bank, and then a new bank is formed, like a holding company or something like that. Let me bring up this chart here. That and it's, it's straight from the FDIC. Okay. And we're they, they have this hypothetical example of when a bank fails. Then what the happens is there and they the FDIC forms a new a new bank, and the let's see here then the the shareholders. They they don't get anything. They, they, it's a complete loss for like the shareholders in the in the bank, and then subordinated debts. So I think that's with other uh, regular loans to the bank. They they lo lose everything. But then these senior unsecured debt. Now that's the debt to the depositors. So. That that stands the senior unsecured debt. That stands for the, the, the yeah the, the people who deposited money. The vast majority don't th see it as uh, a loan, but that's how it's viewed in the law. You, according to law, you you loan them your money when you deposit it. it so automatically, you lose. Looks like you lose three percent according to this hypothetical chart. Now, how actually it would end up working out in a real world? That'd be a whole nother matter. But you'd end up getting a uh, significant portion in exchange for your deposit. You'd get a, a significant portion of that would be just going to new equi equity for this this new in this new form company the FTIC forms. Um, and it would be you you, you might get you might be able to get ret retain. A significant amount of your original deposit. It just depends on how much is needed. And now, if they need to have use up 100% of your deposit to form this new company, um, then that's what I suppose they'd have to do. Um, but regardless, it'd be a significant amount of money that you you thought you had in your in your account would be converted over to shares in this new this holding company and but 
I feel to see how that would be not cause a, a huge systemic problem in the overall economy. You know? So you see, if people have all, all these these shares in this new holding company bank, what I mean, how are they going to use that to pay their bills? That would have a huge knock-on effect on the economy. Or overall economy systemically, I would think. People would like, I don't want these shares. I want to, I, I need money to pay the bills. If you if own a company, you need money to pay the pay. You can't, you know, can't pay your pay, your employees with this, with these new shares. Um, and you can't pay your uh, insurance or property tax, um, utilities. Grocery store, you can't go to one of the grocery store. Hey, let's see, I got these shares here. Uh, let me buy some food. Um, it's not gonna work. And, and of course, if everybody just automatically tries to turn, if I don't know, I don't know if these would be publicly traded shares. I mean, this is so uh, they're, they're so hypothetical. Um, it, it, it seems really dangerous just to assume that this is gonna all work out just nicely without. Uh, you know, I really don't think these policymakers who wrote, who wrote Dodd Frank and uh, um, who are behind this—they're they're not really the smartest people in the room. I, these people—they they get to these positions of power not through being the wisest and smartest people, but being good at—they get there by being good at climbing the bureaucratic and corporate ladders of society. It's, it's not because they're because they're so, um, it's not a, it's not a meritocracy, I don't think. It, it doesn't seem like they really think things through so well. That, that's, that's a problem. And this, yeah, this could be really disastrous. But that's the case with the, the large banks that do qualify as systemically important. The government cannot bail them out. It's not allowed. And, the, so the, in that way, in, in a way, it seems like it seems like it would be safer to have your money in a smaller bank or especially credit union. It seems it seems like to me like it would be. Um, I'm not making any financial advice. I want to make that clear. Um, I'm just I'm just trying to speculate here. So that's what I wanted to say. I guess I, that's all I can think of at the moment. So if you're watching, thanks for watching. Mm hmm.